Freddie, thank you so much for joining us on the Grapple Theory podcast. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, I think we should start off by saying, sort of talking about what we were talking about off camera. Um, you picked up an injury as we were recording this just last week at, at Sovpro. Um, yeah, yeah. Talk to us uh, about that, and because it sounded like you're going to be out for a while from what you said. Yeah, so funny you mentioned Sog Pro because when I was there, I think people thought it was a work. Mm. Um, and I wanted to go to Sog Pro so people knew it wasn't to work and people knew, like, I you know, wasn't like part of the story or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, Saturday night was wrestling at Target in Carlisle, um, got injured, um, shoulder injury, um, got an x ray that night, um, the shoulders fractured. Um, since found out through the week, uh, I'm going to be needing surgery on that, which when I received the information at the start of the week, they didn't think I would. And um, this morning, I went to see a consultant. They didn't think I need surgery. That consultant spoke to his boss. Um, and yeah, I know I need surgery. So um, not not great news, not great timing. No, it's going. That's going. You mentioned, um, that because that intrigues me there, the whole turning up to software thing. Like, in terms of, so people didn't think it was a work, like, is that the sort of thing that goes through your mind? Like, even after, obviously, like, you know, whether or not, like, regardless of how serious the injury was, like, whether it was a less serious injury for something else, is that something that always goes through your mind in terms of, I, I need to do this so that the fans don't get the wrong idea sort of thing? I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, I've told me by a few years ago, and I always, the shows that still wanted me on, some shows that are more storyline driven, angle driven, promo driven, mm. but still have me on as a character. Um, the ones at the top of my head, North, Rise, Defiant, um, they had me on as a regular feature still. And then kind of smaller shows without maybe, maybe it's an online presence where it's just matches kind of, yeah, there's no need for me to be there. Mm. So with Sov Pro, I know there's obviously like a lot of storylines, a lot of promos, things like that. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was there so it wasn't like fans didn't think that oh it's just some work or part of it like we turned it around into part of you know the angle on the on the day but mm. it, when I came with the sling on I think fans still thought like it's a it's a work and that was uh I was going to do something physical but yeah just the reality is my shoulders just go stay mm. and I do anything no, that's absolutely going. No, it's it's going to hear that. It's going to hear that and gutted for you. And hopefully, hopefully you'll be back sooner rather than later. Hopefully we'll look at like some sort of John Cena miracle turnaround, and you'll be back in in a in shorter time rather than longer. Um, but um, I mean, we've spoken to a few wrestlers that have that have had sort of big injury layoffs, and I can't even imagine how like frustrating it must be to like, especially like considering in in my mind the sort of twenty twenty two that you'd had, and you just seem to be rising and, and gaining momentum and being put in those sort of bigger storylines and bigger promotions. It, it must be really frustrating when, when something like that hits while you're sort of like on the way up on that roller coaster. Yeah, definitely. Like since coming back from lockdown, um, I think like wrestling just got better and better for me. Mm. Uh, in terms of like my performances, the matches I'm putting on, the vignettes or promos I've been involved in and kind of put out, the promotions I've debuted at, the angles or the way that I've been featured on the promotions that I'm, you know, a regular on. Um, I've just been used in my kind of more prominent positions and I've been given, you know, really good opponents to wrestle. Um, I've just had really good opportunities throughout 2022. Um, and it's kind of like I was coming into this year now thinking, right, this is, you know, building on that. Uh, I had quite a few, like, schedule-wise, was quite busy up until April, May time with bookings and um, had some good shows to be debuting at this year um, and it kind of like before things have actually took off it's like came to a halt already. Mm, yeah, yeah, that, that is going, that is absolutely going and well, I mean hopefully it's something that will pick up sort of once you're back you'll be able to pick up sort of where you left off in, in those promotions. Oh. I mean, I've been injured once before with wrestling. Mm -hmm. Like, I tore a bicep and I was gone for, it was like 13 weeks between, mm -hmm. like, being injured and being able to wrestle again. And I kind of came back and just slotted in pretty nicely to, you know, where I, where I was and didn't lose so much. But it's just a frustrating thing. It's more of like a, like, can we swear on this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can, it's, it's no holds barred here. Well, just like a head fuck then. Because mm -hmm. I know physically I can recover. It's just that mental thing of, like, race. I'm going to be out for X amount of months. 
that's X amount of months um, not progressing towards my goals. Mm. The older you get, obviously, the less chance you have of getting, you know, to where you want to be. It's just a head fuck. I think that's the thing, isn't it? I think especially for, like, indie wrestling is is the mental side of it more than the physical side. Because, like you say, like, again, maybe to not the extent you have, but, like, wrestlers pick up injuries all the time. You know, wrestlers will be out for maybe, like, a few weeks, a month, a couple of months at a time at certain points. And it's it's more like, it, from what we've talked about with other people, it seems more that it's it's the mental side of, like, what will the scene be like when I return? Will I be able to slot back in? Will I still get these opportunities? Yeah, I think, well, I think for me, it's not even so much. It's more a case of, like, I'm kind of hitting me stride and making this progress. And it's not so much I'm concerned about, oh, can I fit back in or will there be a spot mm. for me? There will be. For me, it's more a case of, right, let's say if I'm gone for six months, that's six months of matches that I'm not having, that's six mm. months of building up a buzz, building up my profile, six months lost of being able to work to get to where I want to be. For me, like, it's no secret, um, I say this all the time on podcasts, I got into wrestling with one goal to work for WWE. Mm. Um, training a little bit later than most people I was 26 when I started training for me my goal and only goal is to get to do a degree um, it's fun doing the indie shows and it's fun being on Brit wrestling things like that but I never got into wrestling to just be an indie wrestler mm. just, you know someone who does this on the weekend like I got into this with the end goal of right I want to get to do a degree so to get there you kind of work you up you work around the scene you build up a buzz blah 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 and it's just more of, so like six months of now not being able to progress towards that. No, sure, and sure. Out of wrestling, it's six months of so I was going to compete. I've never missed a Britain this year, bodybuilding. Mm. I won that show last year, I'd have been defending my title this year to try and compete for the universe again. And that's gone now mm. as well. Yeah. No, yeah, I can imagine that must be really frustrating. And and that's the thing, like, you talk about um the, the end goal and that's really interesting as well because um last interview before yours uh, in terms of chronology as well as well as when uh, when it comes out um we spoke to rain leverkusen um who's like big rising star down here in london really hitting the scene well um and she spoke quite openly as well about how like that's her end goal is wwe and that's something if i'm honest i've I'd, I'd not heard a lot of people say openly on this podcast is that like the goal is WWE, like, you can enjoy the other stuff, but, like, that's the, the ambition, that's the top ambition. Yeah. Um, is there sort of that um, ability to still enjoy the ride while you're on your way up, while, like, being so focused on that end goal? Like, are you still able to sort of enjoy those moments that you do get, or is it very much like, in your mind, I've had this goal, and that's another step towards the end goal? It was more of the latter, to be honest, mm. like, I enjoy wrestling. Like you've got to love wrestling to do it because anyone that just does this as a hobby, I don't know how they do it because it's so demanding, so mm. draining. Like mentally, physically, the time that you put into it, um, to be just a hobby, it's like would be mental. For me, there's a bigger goal in mind. Um, for me, it is difficult to enjoy when I know that, like, so for example, I need to UK. Um, I never got a look in with mm. NXT UK and then that closed down so when you're seeing like other rest being featured it's not a case of jealousy mm. it's more a case of maybe it's envy or mm. it's kind of like right this guy is being featured what do I need to do to get featured and mm. I'm doing everything I get told like you know I have a couple of good mentors in wrestling and you do everything you you know you get told and you're doing it, you're improving, and you told you, you know, people say, oh, you're getting better, this is good, blah, blah, blah. And you just don't get those opportunities or those breaks. It's then like, what am I doing wrong? It's hard to enjoy, it's hard to appreciate what you've got. And I'm always kind of like, focused on what I don't have, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I get that, I get that. And uh, that's interesting as well, because like, I'm curious in, in your mind then, is, um is bodybuilding more rewarding for you? Because we've had like Roy Johnson on the podcast as well. He does bodybuilding as well. And he says for like, for those sort of things, and like he used to do powerlifting as well, like in terms of those sort of like more sports sports, I guess, um, it's the case where like, if you're the best, you're the, like you win because you're the best. Whereas with wrestling, that's not always the case. Like you could be the best technical wrestler, but you might not win the belts or get the opportunities because it's down to someone else's perception of you rather than whether you are the best. 
So is, is in, in your mind then, do you find bodybuilding more rewarding of the two things? Because it's sort of that end goal where if you win, you, you're sort of proven you're the top person. Mm, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't say so because bodybuilding is very subjective. Mm. It's, it's, you know, you can have five bodybuilders on stage to your average person all look incredible. Mm. And then to a bodybuilding judge or a panel of judges, you know, it's up to them as to where you, you know, where you play. So with bodybuilding, it's not a clear cut of winner and loser. It's subjective and people are voting on that. It's not mm. like, I mean, I've never competed in powerlifting. I trained as a powerlifter when I was younger. But with powerlifting, it's like, well, you lift the weight and whoever lifts the most wins. Mm. With building, it's still a subjective kind of thing. And with wrestling, um, wrestling's not a sport, it's entertainment. Mm. Uh, there's obviously sporting elements and it's athletic, but it is entertainment. Um, so I wouldn't say bodybuilding is more rewarding um, than wrestling. For me, wrestling is what I wanted to do since I was a little kid. Mm. Uh, I think it's easy for people, to, like for fans who maybe don't know me or you know, maybe trolls online and just look at a body guy and think, oh, he's only in wrestling because of how he looks. He doesn't love wrestling. But for me, I've loved wrestling since I was a kid. Mm. I remember life without wrestling because I have two older brothers. So wrestling was always on in my household when I was a little kid. And the reason I started going to the gym and lifting weights was because from a young age, I wanted to look like a wrestler. Mm. And we're all jacked up, you know, jacked up guys. So for me, like my love of wrestling is what got me into the gym. And then I kind of fell into bodybuilding. I lifting, going to the gym, then research and reading what to eat, how to lift. You kind of stumble across bodybuilding. And that's kind of what I got interested in with bodybuilding. So mm. I do enjoy competing. Um, it's, it is rewarding, don't get me wrong, it is rewarding. Last year was my best year of wrestling and my best year of bodybuilding. I won the number Mr. Britain, which is like mm. a really prestigious title in bodybuilding. And that was so rewarding. I was buzzing with that. I was able to compete at the Nabi Mr. Universe and place like fifth, mm. which is a global competition. I was buzzing with that achievement. But in terms of being more rewarding, I wouldn't now I wouldn't say it's more rewarding. Sure, sure. And um, I mean in that case, like you sort of like say that, like is it like wi winning the um, Mr. Britain? Like was, was that the same sort of again like the same sort of feeling as like picking up a, a like a, a title belt in the ring right is it that same no i think so winning a body winning mr britain it was like i did feel really proud of, like, i'd accomplish something i think winning a belt at least for me on the indie scene winning a belt isn't kind of that's not the reward mm. for me the reward is being involved in like a good match a good angle with crowd, when you know the crowd are invested, mm -hmm. that are rewarding because I could go to a someone could make a promotion tomorrow and be like, Shred your win in this belt, and it means nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what I mean? There could be 10 people in the crowds, it could be someone who's just started a promotion in a social club, or you're winning this belt, and it means nothing. Mm -hmm. Being involved in shows where they have a good following with good fans that appreciate what you're doing, that are invested in what you're doing, that's what's rewarding. Like for me, the work that I've done at North is some of the most rewarding stuff I've done because of the crowd reactions that I get. Um, that for me is the rewarding part of wrestling when you know you're involved in some good and you're able to make that crowd connection. Mm. The rewarding thing in wrestling is probably the opportunities you get as in, the porn, like if someone's booking a show and they put you on against an import who, you know, I've got to do a spot with Scotty Twatty last year. Mm. I, I was buzzing with that because Scotty was one of my favourites when I was a kid. Um, debuting at some of the bigger shows like ICW Progress last year, that's rewarding because that's almost like, right, this is a result of what I've done. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. And like looking back, um, just sort of like a, a sort of new question I featured into into my sort of like roster of questions here with with people. Um, it's something like I know you've talked and you've talked in previous podcasts as a lot of people have about like how you got into wrestling. But in terms of looking back on it, like almost in in hindsight, is there a particular like moment in like say your childhood or like that that you like can pinpoint as like 
this is the moment that led me to where I am today. This is the thing that made me who I am today. Not from ch not from childhood, and there was there wasn't anything specific that I'll, that made me think. Right, I want to train to be a wrestler. Mm. Uh, I just loved wrestling. Really loved wrestling when I was a kid. Give it a little go. When I was fifteen, did two training sessions, but my parents put a stop to it. Um, after all that, sorry, loads of times on the podcasts. Then I remember I tried to get involved in training again when I was twenty one, maybe. Mm. And I think what sparked it for me is that as it sounds, I remember when Miz won the WWE title, he cashed mm. money in Sardin. And I remember I was at uni at the time, and one of my best mates, we were both big wrestling fans. And I was like, if the Miz has not just made it to WWE, but has become WWE champion and is going on to main event WrestleMania, I can surely be a wrestler. Mm. That's kind of what I remember that's like. <laughs> the mentality I had and um, so that got me started wrestling again when I was like 21 found a local training school that went tits up after a couple of months it's closed down and I just really soured me on wrestling because I tried twice to like get into wrestling just it didn't work out and then the final time when I got into wrestling what made me stick with it I was 26 and um, NGW was running a show in Hartlepool, which is where I lived. Me and my mates went to go and watch it. There was flies on the like, seats with the Facebook and the training school. I went on, saw that the training school was like a 35 minute drive from where I lived. And I was like, oh, I'm an adult now. I've got my own car. I'm going to give it a go. And that's what kind of did us. Yeah, no, that's cool. I like that. I like that. Is there ever a time where you look back and you're like, almost like you say, because that, that end goal, like you said, is WWE. Is there ever a time you, you look back and you're like, almost like we said with the injury, like those times that you sort of quit wrestling, like you gave up on it after a few sessions and stuff like and went back to it. Is, is there ever a time you look back and you think like that was not wasted time in your life, but like in terms of making that end goal of getting to WWE, you're like, I could have been five years further ahead in, in the... Definitely, yeah, I mean, I think if I stuck with it when I was 21, mm. um, I think I'd be a lot further on now because... When I started wrestling, it was kind of just as the big indie buzz was dying down. Like, I've had guys a lot more experienced than me. So if I came along a year or two years earlier, mm. I've so many more opportunities than what I've had. And those opportunities could have potentially led to something bigger for me. Um, so I kind of think if I was, you know, if I stuck with it when I was 20, 21, whatever it was, um, you know, I would have had been around for that big boom. I'd have, you know, I'd have a lot more experience on my side. But it just, obviously, I didn't stick with it then. Um, it wasn't meant to be. So I don't really look back with regret because I'm not that kind of person. Like, if you think like that, you might as well think, oh, well, if I knew last week's lottery numbers, I'd be a millionaire like now, right, right now. And, mm. you know, that's just a stupid way to look at life. So I just don't, don't even think like that. No, sure. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, like, you can't look back and you've only got to look forwards. you always got to look forwards. There's no point, like, dwelling on the past. Uh, you can't change it, so what's the point? No, no, I get it. I get it. Um, talk to me about, um, we mentioned Soft Pro a bit, talk to me about Soft Pro as a, as a promotion, just because um, obviously you've got that sort of, you had that rivalry going on with uh, Commander Stephanie Sterling, uh, who's someone who's really making a name for themselves, like coming back over here, because obviously they lived in America for so long, and now back over here really making a name for themselves on the scene. Um, talk to me about sort of like that rivalry, and, and Soft Pro in general, because Soft Pro is a place that like, Despite the fact they've only had a couple of shows, it's getting massive buzz at the minute. Like, talk to me about how how they're running and how they're doing it. Because fr from all from all what I've heard, it sounds like they're just running really solid shows. But it's like crazy how much buzz they've got after only a couple of shows. So I mean, my experience with them is pretty limited. Mm. They asked to do the fair show, but I had a booking on that same date, so, so I, I couldn't do the fair show for them. Then there was a TNT show, I think it was called Extreme Fields, mm. like multiple promotions, and the message me wanted me to do that show, but I was the TNT Ignition champ at the time, mm. and they wanted me wrestling their champ, which I think was Bullet, um, and it was a case where like TNT didn't want me to lose, Soft Pro didn't want their guy to lose, that didn't come off. So anyway, I got this date for this show, um, so that was my first time actually going down to South Pro. Mm. Being, it reminded me a little bit of the um, Defying shows, and I think that's probably because it was in the same venue. Mm. 
the production values were really good. There was tons of people there. But I mean, it's two shows in. It was my first one there. And it looks like it's off to a really good start. Like you say, there's a lot of buzz about it online for such a young show. There was, I want to probably say, 400-ish fans wow. there at the weekend just gone. And after missing the first show, because I already had a booking elsewhere, mm. literally, I was injured Saturday night. I should have been wrestling Sunday. So I didn't want to miss out again. Mm. So, but just to go, you know, I was involved in an angle, get in front of the crowd there. So it was still good to be part of the show. And I'm sure that Sopra is going to probably be a big thing moving forward. Do you, do you get that feeling from, like, whether it's Sopra or anywhere else, but, like, from a promotion, like, your first time there, and it's, like, say, early doors for them, like... Do you get that feeling of, like, they're doing something right here? Or, like, on the opposite end, can you, like, obviously not going to name names, but, like, can you tell a promotion's maybe, like, not doing things right from, like, when you walk in the door? Like, do you get that vibe off them? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm not a promoter myself, so Mm. I don't kind of, like, speak as if, like, oh, well, I'm doing when it comes to promotion because that's not my bag. But Mm. from a wrestler's perspective... You can kind of, like, you know, the same shows that are maybe run better than other shows or the same shows more professional than other shows. So you can kind of go to a show and you get a sense of, like, these guys know what they're doing or like, these guys kind of aren't a good thing. And other shows, maybe it's like, yeah, there's things that could maybe be improved here or this, you know, it's not quite where they want to be yet. Um, there's definitely, like, you can definitely kind of tell that, that difference, yeah. Mm. And we talk about shows that sort of shreddy is synonymous with i think the main one is north uh, that you mentioned before i think we had um we had the guys from north on about a year ago about a year ago now um talking about the promotion and like i asked them like uh what was like if they were to pick like their pillars of north uh, and they like said that you were one of the main pillars of, of the promotion for how long you've been there and what you've done for the company and the fact that you're always sort of giving it your all there yeah. Is it nice to be regarded in that way by a company? Again, like we've spoken a lot about sort of ambitions and goals and, and wanting to do more. But is it nice when, when you have a promotion that sort of considers you, I guess, part of like their, their family and their sort of home base and have, have that feeling like, you, you, know, you know what I'm getting at, like have that feeling yeah. from, from them that they have that, that feeling for you? Yeah, no, definitely. For me, North is what I would consider like my home promotion. North was one of the very first shows that gave me an opportunity to be on shows. Mm. Long before I was like at the point where I could wrestle, I was a character on the show, and I was on a couple of shows before I even made my in-ring wrestling debut. So the fans knew me. I was a character, which made the debut e- like, easier. Uh, North was one of the very first ones to give me that chance and i've always been used featured booked however you want to kind of um, spin it i've always been used in like a really good way at north um i've always yeah I, I, i've had so many opportunities at north and that's then led on to other things for me hmm. so considered like one of like the pillars um if that's what they called me like it is good because it's kind of like i consider that my home promotion so for them to say like oh yeah sure he's like one of our guys it is good because north is like i say you always put no matter what the promotion is i always put effort in and i mm. always want to do a good job but there's something about north that it's like you kind of go the extra mile whether it's you know pitching ideas or when it comes to doing promos or you know whatever it might be like you always go that extra mile i think everybody's got like their home promotion mm. and would definitely be they'd definitely be north. Yeah, yeah. As someone who's like, because you're, you're from um, Durham, aren't you? Right, like Durham, Hartlepool area, like. Hartlepool. Oh. <laughs> so like you're you're and obviously like that's not too far from Newcastle, but like yeah. it seems like just like because if I'm honest, I've never been up to to north uh, for wrestling. I've been up to Newcastle once for for football, um, yeah. uh, but I know that like obviously like Newcastle, that whole area is like it's it's a very. Um, passionate place like they're very passionate about what they're where they're from and who they are and like you know that area do you get that vibe from from the crowd that it's like you know a newcastle crowd do you get that it, the vibe that it's that crowd that are passionate about the things that are in their city i think so i mean that's the name of the promotion north and um, but i'm not a geordie i'm mm. not like a little person so as much as north is my home promotion like i don't share the sense of like oh newcastle like because just Newcastle's still a bit of a trek for me. It's like mm. a drive, so... Okay. Like, I don't consider... Like, I am no way trying to pretend to be from Newcastle mm. or not 
all day. I don't try and pretend to be like. So I, I don't get that sense. But I think the fact that the company is called North, there is, um, you know, a little bit of that colloquialism uh, with Newcastle. But I think it's more than just Newcastle. It's kind of the North East hmm. as a whole. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say, because, like, again, this is speaking as someone who, like, lives in London. But, like, I just get the vibe that, just the north in general, not even northeast, northwest, but like just the north in general, the wrestling scene has a real like community vibe to it. It seems like it's a lot more, I don't want to say together because that makes it sound like the London scene isn't, but it seems like sort of the north scene, the, like the northern wrestling scene is sort of all working to, sort of to pull towards one goal and improving the scene as a whole rather um, than say like being split into like north and TNT and, and things like that and future shock, you know what I mean? At least need to be careful that I'm aware of this because it might come across wrong. Mm. But I would probably disagree with that. Okay. Of the northeast is almost like a forgotten part. I think what mm. you said applies to the northwest. Right. But the northeast, it's kind of like it's very hard. I find it at least, and I think some of the wrestlers kind of feel the same. It's very hard for northeast wrestlers to break out of the northeast. Mm we're not part of those cliques or those friendship groups necessarily like you know you go to the northwest and manchester it's like you'll have a um wrestler debut on a show and there's more wrestlers liking that tweet and sharing that tweet than these fans mm. whereas in the northeast i've won i don't there's as many people training and wrestling in the northeast but i just think in the northeast um there's not really that same sense like we're cut off from mm. other is if that makes sense and I've said this before so it's not a secret mm. like it's just yeah I think in the northeast it's you know the almost is a separation but like this is divide mm. it, but you know we're not part of those same circles or cliques or groups or whatever it might be and that's why I think north like I really like that because north is probably the closest thing or the only thing we've got up this way mm. that of tries to bring people together um, and the try well the, I say the try they do bring people from outside the area from all over the country it's not just northern wrestlers on there um, it is good for the area and it's you know it's a show that I think everybody in the North East aspires like it's the biggest show in the North East mm. the one that all wrestlers would want to aspire to, to get onto. Do you, do you find that, like, again, as a wrestler from the North East and, and, and knowing other wrestlers from the North East, do you think that gives you guys that more, like, that more push, that more, like, I've got a point to prove because we're from an area that is, again, like you say, and I, I would agree with that generally, an area that is probably underappreciated in British wrestling? Oh, yeah, like, I say this half joke of me, half serious, kind of. Like, if I was born, raised, and trained in the Northwest. I'd have been invented WrestleMania by now. Mm. Like, how can he say that? Because the opportunity, not the opportunities, but just like you say, like the exposure that they seem to get compared to the Northeast and the way that they, like, you know, there's so many wrestlers there. Um, the Northeast is definitely kind of, I don't know if underappreciated is the right word, but forgotten about. Mm. Or, and I think, it, I think part of it, it comes down to logistics, as in, if you're a promoter, look at it, put on a show. You want to do things cost effectively, mm. and the northeast is you know right like the Midlands, Northwest. It's pre you can get anywhere pretty much like, but not too far. If you're in the northeast, one there's not as many wrestlers in the northeast doing shows. Mm. Two, it's going to cost more for a promoter to bring a car down or expenses or whatever like that. So I think part of that reason, just unfortunately, is the logistics of. Um, not being able to get on shows or maybe not being as cost effective mm. for orders. So I think that's one of the reasons. Like when I do get shows outside of the Northeast, like I was a regular on TNT, uh, I wrestled at Coliseum Wrestling. Like when I do get those chances outside of the Northeast, I'm really grateful for it. I kind of go to those shows, um, try, not necessarily trying to prove something, but it's just like, yeah, I belong here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Has there ever been like a a thought in your mind to like 
live somewhere else essentially like in terms of like if i moved here i might get more opportunities or yeah so outside of wrestling like i've got a shoot career i, I own my own business now i said my own business up last year like mm. i say i started wrestling when i was older 26 i already had a house and a mortgage i already had a career like wrestling for me i only get to do a degree but i mean when i first started wrestling i would travel to oldham and milnroe every single week to train with Mighty Jones mm. and at one in the morning on a Thursday so I'd get home 10 to 1 um, on a Wednesday night technically Thursday morning I was about half five for work on a Thursday I was getting like four hours sleep and I was just prepared to do those trips and you know to, to train and invest in myself like that and then I kind of think like some of the bigger shows that have got people from the northeast on like those are the shows you want to be on mm. shows that war and willing to pay or can't afford to pay it's like yeah it would be nice to do those shows but maybe those aren't the shows that we need to do if they can't afford or they're not willing to bring people from the northeast on but now i've never kind of considered moving it's just um yeah it's not even something that's kind of it's crossed my mind no sure sure and like again i imagine in your mind it's the case that like doing all that and going on those shows and when you get bookings down here it's all with that goal that end goal of like you know i'm doing this to get me where i want to be um yeah. And is that like, obviously that's the, the driving force. Is it tough then, again, almost like with, with things like this when you're, when you're out in now, is it tough to sort of, again, like realign yourself mentally and be like, you know, I'll, I'll still get back to that stage. I just need to sort of like relax and not panic about it. Yeah, I mean, when I told my bicep, I mean, I'm more calm this time than, and it's probably going to be through an injury mm. before an, a wrestling kind of thing. So this time I'm probably more calm about it. There's never a good time to get injured. So it's just kind of, I'm looking at this as like, it is what it is. Um, there's no point panicking or flapping because that's not going to help anything. It's just a case of like, I'm going to be out for X amount of time. And I won't know what that is until I spoke to the consultant and had the surgery and things like that. Um, and I'm not worried like, oh, there's not going to be a spot for me in three months time or six mm. months time. Like, I am. I'm not saying I'm the best wrestler at all. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not known as a technical wrestler or an amazing wrestler. But I kind of have my own. Um, you know, there's not many guys in Brit Wrestle who, as an overall package, can offer what I do. And mm. uh, arrogant way, I'm just saying it as in like people fill roles. Like it's almost like you cast different roles for a TV show or a film or something. Like when people are booking wrestling shows, they're almost casting certain wrestlers for a position and there's not many people who can kind of you know fill the role that i fill in brit rest so i'm not worried that like there's not going to be space for me or i'm going to be forgotten about like i say my only concern is it's six months where i can't make the progress that i want to make mm. no sure sure um and a lot of people on these sort of podcasts will ask you know the like, questions like the dream match i don't want to ask about the dream match because that's too obvious but I want to ask about, you mentioned the fact that you're not a promoter. I'm going to put you in a, in a promoter role right now, put you on the spot. You're yeah. a, but you're not promoting a wrestling show. You're promoting a bodybuilding competition involving right. British wrestlers. So you've right. got to pick, like, say, your five finalists. Just like, again, from like what you've seen, from who you know, on the British wrestling scene, you're like five finalists for the British wrestling bodybuilding finals. Who's making that podium? Who's going to be on that stage? Who do you look at and you're like, oh, they like they do it in bodybuilding, like they're ripped. No, this is where I get heat with everyone. <laughs> I probably can't think of five people who are on the bodybuilding stage. It, uh, I know Yeston has competed in bodybuilding, hmm. and Ray Johnson's competed in bodybuilding. And I'm looking at this not in a way to be a dick or not in a way to like bury anybody intentionally, but the difference between being in shape for wrestling hmm. and being in shape for bodybuilding is something that wrestling fans just don't understand mm. like it's just a complete like a complete world apart like wrestling fans will think i'm big i'm jacked i'm in shape whatever blah 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 i've been at so i, I train in a gym that is owned by um a guy called eddie elwood he has won the mr universe five times he's won it more times than alice Schwarzenegger. When he competed, he was competing 285 pounds on stage, mm. ripped. That is huge. Like, like, you 
couldn't comprehend the size of somebody like that okay so I'm not that big but people like wrestling fans kind of sometimes go on at me as if like I am that big mm. or like I know what really big guys are like in bodybuilding yeah and building conditions like and it's just a world apart like there's guys in wrestling who are in shape don't get me wrong mm. uh, I think people think that I expect because of what my character is, my gimmick is, and because of just what I'm like as an amateur gym guy. Like, I think people think that I expect all wrestlers to look like that, but they shouldn't. Like, wrestling yeah. would be wrong. If every wrestler looked like me, or if every wrestler looked like a bodybuilder, then what's the point of my gimmick? What's mm. the point of doing? Yeah, you need that variety. Um, it's my character, the Jack Stack Daddy um, character, the persona, is, you know, like, I think... I'm the only one that looks like a proper wrestler. When I say a proper wrestler, mm. the typical 80s, 90s kind of wrestler look. And I really play into that. I lean into that. That's kind of what the character stems from. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, but there's only Yeston and Roy Johnson who, oh no, there's um, uh, a guy from Wales as well who competed in the, I think, competed in the universe in the class bodybuilding class. Um, he would obviously he's been there he, you know he's competed as well so yeah you've got like four people who actually competed mm. uh, on a bodybuilding stage and uh, there's a lot of you know really in shape guys but there's a massive difference between like i say the wrestling look and the bodybuilding look oh for sure for sure so like in, in like me on that like in terms of like you're up there on stage in a bodybuilding competition yeah. Um, and like you're flexing your muscles, you're doing all your like poses and stuff. I saw like you did the Batista one as well, which is great. Yeah. Like that's fucking amazing. But like, what are those judges look like? What are they grading you on? What are they looking for? They're, like, like you say, obviously it's completely world apart from wrestling. But yeah. in terms of like your physique and what, like, say what I can see as a wrestling fan based on what they can see, what yeah. are the specifics that they're looking for that that get you that crown? So in bodybuilding, they're looking for size conditioning and by conditioning i mean like how defined you are how mm. lean you are they're looking for balance balanced physique and symmetry so what i mean by symmetry is let's say you have huge shoulders and arms but skinny legs mm. metrical okay um they're looking for good like size but size alone can't win your shows just like condition and being lean alone can't win your shows it's a combination of size, conditioning, balance, symmetry, in an aesthetic look, mm. okay? Be a really freaky looking bodybuilder. And this is where this, like, the, the judges and the subjectivity comes into it. You could have what a casual average person would look at. That you might have two bodybuilders on stage, one who is a freak, he's huge, veins everywhere, but he's got like, when I say gut, I don't mean he's fat, it's just like his gut's a bit extended, but there's mm -hmm. abs on the end of us. He's huge. You might have another guy who weighs 80 pounds less than him, is slim, quite of a slender look, but just aesthetically very pleasing to look at. Two very different physiques. And it's kind of up to the judges to be mm -hmm. like, right, which one of these is best? So when I say like, when a wrestling fan looks at me, like, I remember when I went to Coliseum, debuted there, and um, my girlfriend Alice um, was there, and she usually films my matches, because then I'll watch my matches back, mm. I send them all to get feedback on them and things like that. And she said there were some guys stood next to her who couldn't believe like the size of me when I came out. And that's always a compliment for me, when mm. people think, I get it quite a bit, people always, when they see me in person, who've never seen me in person, or they might follow me on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, to see me in person and more often than not to think I'm bigger in person mm. than expected me to be from like my photos which is always positive because usually people have these really good photos built as in perfect lighting then they see them in person they don't look the same so I'm almost like a reverse catfish in that sense which is like the best compliment <laughs> I can when it comes to me physique but these guys thought like, oh, I looked absolutely like mid, like mid physique blah 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 but I, I remember at Coliseum, it was about five weeks after I'd competed at the Britain, mm. and I'd a lot of body fat on from the show to then. And I was in no way fat, but me as a bodybuilder, I was like, right, I'm not in good shape now. Mm. But a wrestling fan just looks at a wrestler, if they're, it doesn't matter if they're ripped with abs or they're absolutely massive, 
I think a wrestler fan doesn't really tell the difference or they don't really care about the difference. They just think Shreddy's a beast or Shreddy's a powerhouse or whatever. And it's like, it doesn't matter if I've got striations or, you know, veins and vascularity. They just see it as like, oh, Shreddy's jacked up. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I appreciate you you giving me that insight because that is that is interesting. Because again, like, yeah, I look at you and I'm like, shit, like, you're absolutely ripped. And like, yeah. in my mind, I can't imagine anyone being more ripped but, yeah. like, it's quite funny that in your mind, that if I said that to you, you'd be like, that's nothing. Like, you've seen nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, it's like if you look at a photo of me, like promo photos, mm. for example, like, sometimes I have promo photos where I've just done a show, I was just after a show, and then there'll be times where, like, I'm not prepping for a bodybuilding show. And to me, the physique difference is massive. Mm. Where a fan, the look and the probably don't even really tell the difference. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Exactly. Um, well, that sort of brings us nicely onto our, our first feature because I sort of maybe like, you know, like you said, got you a little bit of heat with that last question. Uh, yeah. But our, our first feature is called Dishing the Dirt. And this is where you're going to get a little bit more heat because right. um, we always get each wrestler to sort of pick the promotion they're synonymous with. So in your case, it'll be North. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going to ask you some questions sort of about the locker room. And yeah. you let me know which member of the locker room comes to mind when I give you each question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for All it. right. Okay. So the first one is uh, who's always running late? Irish Rory Coyle. Yeah. <laughs> is he? Yeah. <laughs> Just before Bell or something, like. Yeah. Yeah. Right on doors. Love it. Love it. Rory got to step up. <laughs> uh, next one is uh, where is the next one? I've lost it. The page is gone. Just turned off on me. There we go. Uh, who has the worst music taste? Ooh, worst music taste. I mean. I'm not a massive music guy myself, so mm. I wouldn't like. I wouldn't be able to answer. Yeah, I don't. I'm the someone who talks music to people, so I wouldn't sure. be all for other people. I'd probably say me. I'm yeah. probably the, it might be you. It might be you. Then. Music, which, if it wasn't on Tony Hawk's Two or <laughs> a SmackDown versus Raw again, I don't know. Oh, to be fair, those are elite playlists, though, aren't they? Like that yeah. actually means you've got good music taste. <laughs> Uh, the next one is that uh, who's who's the funniest? Who's the best comedian in the locker room? So Sean, the ref from ICW, is always fun to be around. Um, I wouldn't say comedian, but like, it's always good crack when Sean's there. It just being like wrong with me, like when you're with your mates, that's the good crack. So for me, mm. it's like Benji, Irish. Those are like some like some of my closest mates in wrestling. So that you can always have a good crack like when you're with your mates. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, the next one is uh, who takes the longest to get ready? Like you're already at the show, but like you know, who takes the longest to get ready? Like for their match before they get out. To get ready for their match, I don't know, but to get re- like change mm. after Irish again is it <laughs> with Irish? So but the reason I said it was always running late. It's Irish, by the way, is Rory Coyle. Mm. Um, we have a name for time when it comes to Irish. We call it Irish time because he's never on time. He's always late. And when we get changed, like that's always the longest guy to get changed after as well. Although I think I am quite guilty of that as well. I take a long time to get changed. Yeah. I get changed quickly to wrestle, but then when I've wrestled, I'm just a sweaty mess. I just want to chill out. Like, I am quite bad for getting changed after the match yeah you need a bit of a cool down before you actually get changed yeah 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 i get that i get that uh the next one is um like who brings the best snacks or like food in terms of like if someone brings their like lunch or like their like so, pre-show uh, meal like my lunch well it always be my meal prep but i would have to say alice which is my girlfriend mm. she always brings snacks she has a little snack pal she's always bringing snacks to the wrestling shows so mm. i would have to say she is the best snacks now it's not always snacks that i would eat but she is probably dominates the snack niche when it comes to wrestling shows. Nice. What, what does she bring? What sort of stuff are we talking? Oh, chase anything. Like you, you imagine it, just chocolate, sweets. You imagine it, she's got us. A... Love it. Like a little tuck shop sort of thing. Oh, she literally has a bum bag. And she pulls it the snack pouch. It's like a little kangaroo, you know, old kangaroos have the little baby <laughs> pouch. That's what she's got. I love that. That's great. Again, you could open a tuck shop like that. Just start passing out in the crowd. It'd be great. Make a killing. Uh, the next one is... Um, now, this is the one I always say will get you the heat. This is the one that will get you the real-life heat. Because I'm not talking in the ring now. I'm talking away from the ring. Who has the worst dress sense? 
G money. <laughs> Definitely. I saw G money walking around with le- le- leopards, or what's it called? Dungarees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, by hands down, I would have to say um, G money. Possibly as well, Jack Turner. <laughs> I'm a good friend of Jack Turner. Me and Jack broke a ring once together before. Jack has sometimes an awful dress sense. Don't want to be seeing them on a night out. That would scare everyone away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. Uh, the next one is nicer, though, because it's on the opposite end, and it's in the ring. So, like, if you didn't have your own ring gear, whose ring gear would you want, like, out of all the ones that people wear? Whose do you look at, and you're like, that's nice, actually. Like, I could see myself in that. Um, ooh, let's have a think. Not Gene Money. <laughs> Not Gene Money, yeah. And this is where, this is where I can reverse the more. Gene Money. Yeah, Gene... you got to remember, though, if you say Gene Money, that means you got to wear the nipple tape as well and everything. Yeah, I don't want to cover the chest. Yeah. Was that for surely? Um, I don't know. This is a different answer to the question asked. What's mm. the So, Rich Swift, referee Rich Swift, and um, formerly known as Will Charlton of NXT UK, we went to a Matty Jones seminar years ago with Harry Smith. Mm. We were like, I don't know, an hour away from home, about an hour away from the venue. So, we we're at like that midpoint. And I realized I forgot my trainers. And I was like, I've got, because I think I was coming straight from work. So I had like my work shoes on, didn't have my pairs, and I forgot to put my trainers in my uh, me bag. He had a spare pair of trainers mm. and me his pair of trainers so I could actually train. And the wrestling boots that I use were actually given, well, I say given to me, I'm loaning them um, from Rich Swift as well. So I've never bought a proper pair of wrestling boots. The ones that I wear um, are Rich Swift, so I always know that um, Rich Swift would have something for me to wear. Oh my god! Well, so basically, he's he's to thank really for everything you've done. Oh yes, it was a swap from the old old <laughs> um, bodybuilding boots, so Rich Swift's boots. That's when the three, but not that's the tra- the trajectory of Shreddy. There we go. It's all down to Rich. What a legend! What a legend! Well, I mean, like um, again, it's not the worst thing though, because we had um, we had Mad Kurt on on the show, and he said that once he had to pa- uh, borrow a pair of Michael Oku's trunks, and I think right. borrowing trunks is probably worse than borrowing trainers. Yeah, very easy. Yeah. <laughs> Just at least mentally getting over that mental hurdle seems like it would be. <laughs> yeah, especially with somebody else's name. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next one is a. Uh, I always say it seems kind of weird to ask to a, a a wrestler, but who's the most competitive? Like. Either in or out the ring. Who most competitive? Um, maybe so. At North, I would maybe say HC Drake. There's mm. been times where like he is quite competitive over silly things, over small things like run of the ropes, who can do it the fastest. Um, yeah, I would say HC Drake. Yeah, no, I like it. I like it. That sort of thing where, again, it doesn't need to be a match, but like those things where that person needs to be like the number one, like doesn't like losing, just can't. Yes, I'm like, I'll make smash my heart. Yeah, I think that's the way, innit? That's the way. Yeah, the next one, we're in with a couple of nice ones. Uh, it's who in the locker room would throw the best party? Who would throw a party worthy of Shreddy being invited? So. The kind of party that I would enjoy might be very different to mm. the kind of parties that other wrestlers enjoy. Um, as you can see from my background, I'm a man of particular taste. <laughs> but I think Benji, who is also a massive nerd, mm. one of the that I know, Benji would probably throw a party worthy of Shreddy. Nice, nice. What sort of party are we talking about? Are we talking like sort of almost like card games, like board games sort of thing, or like... <laughs> Not card games, but just games, just a game and day, game and night, something like that. Just nice. me and Ben have loads of the same interests, like all you know, kids' programs that we used to watch and things like that. So yeah, I think getting thrown a party would be, um, you know, that would be kind of right up my alley. Nice, I like it. I like it. I'll have to get an invite to that party as well because I'd be up for yeah, that. Yeah. Look, especially if you're playing things like Pokemon as well. Like I'll be right there. I'll be right there. What is your like? Who who's in your like? You know, like the, the typical question Pokemon was like, who's who's in your like six? Who's your 
if you have the choice, you know, the ones that you'd always try and catch to put in your team. Yeah, like, I mean, I love Pokemon, but after Gen 2, I'm like, what the fuck is oh, this? Oh, to be honest, I'm the same. Like, yeah. I, I play, like, I've got the new one now, and I, like, look at it, and I'm like, half the Pokemon, I'm like, who the fuck is this? Yeah, it's, I've played almost all the Pokemon games, but it's like, past Gen 2, I'm like, uh, so who would be top six base? So I always like having um, an Alakazam and a Gengar in there. Yes. Because yeah, you need to trade them, so mm. it's like a bit of a chill one. Um, I like use the legendary. Some people don't, so mm. don't don't like a Mewtwo in there. Um, I like um, the start of Pokemon. I don't usually like having more than one of the starters in my team. Mm. Like go with either a Charizard or a Blastoise. These are Gen One. I'm not even mentioning Gen Two. No, Gen One is where it's at, though, isn't it? That's the yeah. one. So I was like then. Um, and then maybe he's a Machamp mm. or an Arcanine. Again, those are two that I like. Or an Evolution. There's always, you can pretty much guarantee whenever I'm playing Pokemon, if there is like a Kadabra to get an Alakazam or a Haunter Ghastly, mm. uh, a Haunter into a Gengar, I'm pretty much always going to have one of those on my team. Uh, yeah. the and then yeah the rest is kind of like you know you can pick a little bit mm. it like revolves around those kinds of guys no i get that i get that like dream wise for me it would be all the evolutions but okay. like they come too late in the game like eevee comes too late in the game for it to be feasible because then you've yeah. got to level it up to where your level already you is like, you through the early days and you bought a free and then you swap them out for something else yeah you know, I, I i know arcanine though arcanine and gengar i'd agree with like they're always in mind yeah like i was I, I, I can iron in there. Um, I like Gollum as well. I always try and get Gollum if I can. Well, I like having a matchup in my team for, like, you know, like a physical mm. Pokemon. But, yeah, I think, like, I always have, like, a kind of set. But then I sometimes find, like, when I'm playing, I kind of feel, like, especially when I'm playing, like, the later gens, I'm like, I should really try and, like, force myself to use Pokemon that are from this generation. Mm. I'm all in that truck. Or oh, of the newer ones, there's like an electric cork one, like an electric dog. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Luxray or Luxio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then that, that's one that I'll try and have in my team. Um, I'll be honest, outside of that, I would struggle to name. I'd have to <laughs> be like, all oh, right, I love that, I love that. Gen two. That's the thing. I could I can name them, but I wouldn't put, I wouldn't want them. You know what I mean? I wouldn't put them. Yeah. I'd be like, no, I want the classics. I want what I grew up with. Gyarados as well. I always have a Gyarados in my team. Yeah, Gyarados is a classic as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, love a Gyarados. I mean, like in our in our comparing wrestlers to Pokemon, we had you as Machamp, but I'm curious, would you class yourself as something else? Would you see yourself as another Pokemon? I would probably compare me, and this again goes back to that body build because I've been on big blocks. I would probably say I'm a Machoke. Mm. I'm not quite yet. I would put myself as a Machoke. Nice, yeah. Just the two arms, not the four. <laughs> two arms, not yeah. the four. <laughs> Fair play, fair play. I like it. I like it. Um, well, the final question on the dishing the dirt thing is not really, again, it's not really dishing dirt at all. We only had a couple that are actually dishing dirt. I might yeah. need to make some meaner questions. Um, but it's, who would you trust to have your back in the zombie apocalypse? Who who in the North Locker Room are you picking as your partner for the zombie apocalypse? Who do you think would either make, you know, a, a good asset or a good someone you can, like, throw to the wolves kind of thing? <laughs> We're going to struggle to come up with. I have a thing. We'll try and come back. To All right, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Well, you got uh, we got you got a bit of time here because we come on to our, our last feature, and this is now we dish some dirt on other wrestlers. This is about you now because it's called Anatomy of a Pro Wrestler, um, yeah. and this is more of a shoot. This isn't really about Shreddy. This is about like you and what makes you tick, kind of thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, again, I'll just ask you some questions. You let me know what comes to mind. Um, so the first one, conveniently, actually, because we mentioned it, you bringing it to to North uh, in the locker room or to anywhere in the locker room. Um, what is your favourite like pre-show meal? What do you have pre-show? So just, just standard chicken and rice, really. Mm. Um, I went through a little phase when I was going to shows where like I kind of I don't think the anxiety before you perform, just like kind of lose an appetite. But yeah, standard meal prep for me is a chicken and rice. Nice, nice. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's uh, what's your favourite post pinfall pig out? <sighs> So I always like five guys after mm. a month lunch, after I've done like a diet for like a long time. I had a five guys at soft pro. So I would never normally eat junk food before a show. Like mm. if I'm wrestling, 
I would all if I wanted to say I'm going to have a five guys, would always say after because mm. you if you eat like this, if I eat like a burger and fries that I don't normally eat, in kind of certainly stomach, you can feel a bit of Oh, you don't so. want to go wrestle after that, no. <laughs> On Sunday, because I knew I wasn't wrestling, mm. I'll actually have like the five guys before the show. So yeah, probably the poor show would be um, would be a five guys. Although when we do wrestle at North in NEW, we found a petrol station on the way home that sells Calypso slushes, sugar free slushes. Okay, but if I've ever seen sell them. I do like going there for me um, slush, me post show slush in a flapjack. Love it, love it. Some good picks. Uh, and the, the final food based one is just like what would be your like your death row meal, your last meal? Ooh. I don't know, because I, I like the bet like I say five guys probably is one of my favourite cheat meals. Mm. But would I want that to be my last meal? Probably is not. Um I suppose it would have to be something that you don't have regularly. Mm. Like a treat um, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, even like a Five Guys is a treat though, but I wouldn't mm. like, I can have them often enough. Um, I'll probably get Gordon Ramsay to cook me something. Nice. Get, yeah, I'll yeah. Get, and I'd get him to just knock me something. Maybe it's a little Daniel from Gordon Ramsay. Nice, nice. Classic. I like it. I like the Gordon Ramsay touch as well. I think yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. And he can swear at you for why you're on death row. <laughs> Love it. Uh, the next one is uh, the movie that I'd show the locker room. So I always say, like, it doesn't have to be your favourite movie, but, like, the movie you think everyone should see. Probably is a film called Chopper. It's uh, Australian. Well, it's about an Australian convict criminal um, based on a true, like, true person. Hmm. Um, the film itself is just called Chopper. Not many people that I know have ever heard of it. No, I've not. But I would always, yeah, I would go, I would go Chopper. Nice, nice. Uh, the next one is, uh, again, you said you weren't that big into music, but it's it's the song that gets me the most hyped. Is there any in particular, like, whether you're at the gym or anything, a song comes on, you're like, that's the one that powers you through? Power Rangers and Raw. Yeah? Power Rangers and Raw, gotta be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it. I like it. That really, like, gets you going as well. Nice, nice. Uh, the next one. The next one's a throwback, because it's my first job. Okay. As in, like, sorry, that's it. That's it oh, for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, so my first job was, uh, I worked in a warehouse, and I hated this. <laughs> and I when I was in like, that job, I looked around at people who were like in the 50s working in that same job. I am not wasting my life doing this for the next 40 fucking years. Yeah, that's not good. That's never good, is it? When you look around and you're like, you're the youngest there by a comfortable margin. Yeah, and I was like, this for Kerry's, um, I call it Kerry's from, from Harry Potter, mm. actually Curry's yeah. um, Wells. Um, but yeah, I, that was my first job. Worked there as part time through uni. Fucking hated it. And the managers would speak to me like I was a moron. Like this was going to be my job for life. Pricks, just uh, yeah, people on power trips. Like awful place to work. Yeah, we we talked about how the regular like public or wrestling fans see you. It'd be interesting to see how how your old bosses would see you now if you turned up. Like, <laughs> so I've, I've told the story as well to people before. A couple of years ago, it was Boxing Day, um, and so when I worked there, the big thing like Boxing Day was their busiest day mm. of the year. So there was a manager there called Graham. I can't remember his name, but he was a big fat cunt, um, and he was he looked like Shrek basically. Okay, and he was a right prick. And fast forward to, I want to say it was maybe three years ago, Boxing Day, me, my girlfriend, and her dad was visiting. So mm-hmm. we went up to Newcastle um, just for like a day out on Boxing Day. And he was wanting to buy us a Dyson. He said that he'll get us a Dyson. So we went into Kerry's, bought it, walking out of the shop. And I see my old manager stood at the doors of, I worked in the Hartley Pool store, and he worked in the Hartley Pool store at the time. Mm-hmm. He um, was obviously working in this Newcastle shop to stay. He's called Graham. So I showed him, went, Graham. And he looked at me and he couldn't tell, he didn't recognise me. He said, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, I don't remember me, do you? He was like, should I? I said, well, I worked with you for three years. And then he did that, oh, yeah, I know you're right. I was like, I could tell he didn't remember me. And I walked out of that shop with so much relief, thinking, like, where my life is now compared to what it was when I was 18, 19, mm. Was working there, how much I've progressed and how much better my life is, and kind of how much I've developed my career and as a person, and like how happy I am now. And I know he hated working boxing days. Mm. All this time on, all these years forward, 
he is still in that miserable fucking job. And that was a really satisfying moment for me. Yeah, that is satisfying. I like that. I like that. I can respect that. Because that is really nice when like you're like, oh, I'm like further forward and this person is still back where they were when I left. Like that. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, the next one is, uh, it's the only time we get a little deep on the show because it's my greatest fear. Greatest fear would be uh, Miguel for getting pregnant. Mm. <laughs> that, that would be game over for me. Yeah. That's, that, I think you're definitely the first person to ever say that. That's the first time I've heard that. Kids. I do not want kids. <laughs> ever have kids. Uh, and that would be my biggest fear, having the kids. No, that's fair enough. I, I don't want kids either, so I can relate to that. I get that. Uh, the next one is uh, my favourite animal. They're animal cats because I'm now a cat daddy. Yeah. Uh, two cats. Last year, Vader and Orby got two kittens. We rescued them from like a cat sanctuary, cat shelter, whatever they're called. Um, I never, so when I was a kid, I had two dogs, but I've never really been, that was when I was like a real little kid. Mm-hmm. And I've really been a pet person or an animal person because I'm quite selfish with my time and what I want to do, like bodybuilding, wrestling, blah, blah, blah. It's like quite selfish with, you know, what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I was thought like I don't have time for an animal. I don't want to be responsible for an animal anyway. Alice has always had um, pets all the way through her life, and she is from Liverpool. She moved up with me a couple of years ago, so she had cats um, in Liverpool. Like it's like still is with the dad now. Mm. So she's wanted a cat for years. Anyway, last year I kind of crumbled. I was like, right, let's get you a cat. And then um, she only wanted to like uh, rescue one. She didn't want to buy one. She just wants because she likes rescuing mm. animals after so we found a um it was a 12 13 year old cat inquired we didn't hear anything back from the shelter so then she was looking for you know just on the cat shelter page and stuff and she showed me these two so she showed me one called derek and she rang up inquired and it, he'd already been taken so on the phone the woman from the cat sanctuary was like oh we've got another um we've got other kittens but they need go they, there's two and they need to be taken together and she was on speaker and I just looked at Alice and I was like, we're not getting two cats. Then she showed me them. I was like, all right, let's go and see them. We went up to go and see them. And um, as soon as I seen them, I was like, yeah, we need like we need to take these. So we got these two cats, Vader and Orby. We got them when they were about 11 weeks old. We got them in end of October, November last year. Mm. So I once now. Uh, absolutely love them the bits. Yeah, I get that. I love the Star Wars names as well, by the way. Like that's yeah, 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 that's yeah. legend. I like it. I like it. Um, but no, I totally get that because like I was the sort of person that just did not even care about pets until I met my partner, and she made me care about it, and she really wanted a pet, and I was like, oh, let's get a guinea pig because that'll be easy. Yeah. Um, uh, guinea pigs aren't easy. That's what I learned over the last four years is that guinea pigs yeah. aren't easy at all. Um, right. But like, I get that. Like, because they're there a few weeks and you're like, I would die for you now. Like, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. And over, yeah, mate, I love them so much. It's hard. Like, I'm not one of these people where, you know, when people talk about the pets and you're like, all right, I don't care. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't care what you have to like, I absolutely love them. No, I get it. I get it. Same boat. Same boat. Very relatable, very relatable. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've done this, but I feel like if you haven't, it would be a good idea for like um, merch, like a print. Um, you should have a picture, like a promo photo of yourself in your ring gear with the yeah. cats called the Jacked Cat Daddy. 100% I should do that. That's 100%. <laughs> I've actually got a design, not a cat design. I've got a design sat for about eight months, nine months. I've just been too lazy to get... Um, to do with so maybe he's not injured I should do what the rest of Brit Rest does and be like go buy me man <laughs> well you, you got an excuse now don't you, you got an excuse I, I just like the juxtaposition of like you with your massive muscles and stuff just these little cats in your arms I think it'd be great yeah 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 <laughs> brilliant um, uh, the uh, the next one is uh, on this list is my favourite place in the world ooh favourite place in the world mm. uh, it can be as big or small as you want. It can, like, we've had people say countries or, like, Scotty Rourke said it was his bed. Like, it can uh, be anywhere I, I, in the gap. I love being at home. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's like, my favourite place is just being at home. Mm, comfort zone. Yeah. Nice. Exactly that. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, and the final one is uh, my dream holiday destination. Japan. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. In 2020, me and Alice were going to go to Japan. Um, in like the January time, we want to go. Uh, we want to go to Japan, but we also thought, oh, well, we could time it with Wrestle Kingdom and watch, you know, go and see mm. Wrestle Kingdom over there. Because Alice is like a well, was a massive Japanese fan. Like she knows way more than Jap- about Japanese wrestling than what I do. Um, so 
I, I really enjoy Japanese wrestling. Uh, I enjoy watching. It's only since I became a wrestler I thought that I was really familiar with Japanese wrestling. When I was mm. a kid, I watched Japanese was obviously. Um, but we were going to go and watch, um, go to Japan, but kind of watch Wrestle Kingdom while we were there as well. Anyway, it was the year that um, WrestleMania was going to be in Florida. Mm. Changed our mind and we were like, oh, we'll do WrestleMania this year and we can just do Japan like whenever. That was also the other COVID yeah. start. So if we decided to go to our original plan of Japan, we could have been to Japan like in the January and yeah. had a whole year. We didn't. We decided to go to America. We booked it and then obviously the flights, mm. can, travel bans came in, lockdowns, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, we never got to go, but um, Japan would be number one place to go. I would love to go there and wrestle. Yeah. I would go there as a holiday. Like, I would absolutely, like, there's been times where Alice comes in from work and I'm just sat watching, like, random YouTube videos, like, day in the life of a car salesman in Japan, day in the life of an office worker. I know, I know exactly the YouTuber you're talking about as well, because I have watched those exact yeah. videos. <laughs> then, like, she came in, she just couldn't have believed I was with it. But Alice would also, like, that's her number one holiday destination mm. as well. The first person I've ever met who, like, like in terms of like a partner, she's the first girl I've ever met who was like that's her number one destination. Mm. My exes, when I still want to go to Japan, they had no interest in board. Whereas Alice is like that's her number one destination as well. So um yeah, we would love to go there. No, I get that. I get my partner's exactly the same. She wouldn't go for the wrestling. I'd go to the wrestling. She'd go out and explore Tokyo, but like she is just like Japan obsessed. It was like so much in Japan, so, like from being a little kid, like the younger the the earliest franchise i remember being in it was power rangers mm. not known at the time it was japanese mm. obviously i respect like it was all japanese footage from super sentai then i got into pokemon that was like my childhood that you know that just overtook me and consumed my childhood then i got a dragon ball z in Yu-Gi-Oh, in anime and there's just games that i like from japan so there's that like nerdy cultural like that side of things where um i would have to go to japan mm. the rural Japan that I would love to explore. There's Tokyo and the city of Japan that I would love to explore. And then there's the wrestling side as well. Mm -hmm. So there's so much about Japan that I would love to go and enjoy. So yeah, from like I said, the nerdy stuff, the anime, the um, computer games, to the wrestling and just the, you know, Japan as a city, as a country, Tokyo as a city. I would love to go there. No, I'm right with you there. I'm right with you there. I don't know about you, speaking of, because we spoke about Pokemon. Um, and like Japanese culture. So the biggest mind blow moment for me, like as a child, was you know when you watch Pokemon and you watch it with like the English or American dub or whatever. Yeah. Um, and like they have like the, um, what's it called? The Onigiri. And it's like, they call it donuts. Oh, the rice cakes. Yeah, yeah. They call it yeah. donuts on the show. And like yeah. until I was like a teenager, I was like, why are they calling that donuts? It doesn't look like donuts, but I assume yeah. it is. And then you like learn about Japan. You're like, they just, why did they say it was donuts? It's like the opposite. <laughs> Well, there's uh, obviously the rice cake, but I remember thinking when I was a kid, they called them jelly donuts, and I was like, I thought it was being an American thing because in in, in England we would call them jam donuts, mm. and I was like, oh, well, in America they must have jelly donuts, must be different yeah. to out Asian donuts, and then as an adult, <laughs> common sense, and you're not a, yeah. like a, an idiot, yeah. realize that oh, that's actually rice cakes, but they did and they've localized this. Because America and kids in England don't know what rice cakes are. Yeah, they're not going to have the comprehension of like, why would you eat rice as a snack? Like, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> that was a mind blow for me. That was weird. That was weird. Well, that sort of brings it up nicely. I think that's a nice way to end. So, um, Shreddy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I hope thank you've you. enjoyed it. I hope you've, I hope you've had a good time. Yeah, it's been good. I always, uh, always enjoy doing stuff like this, so thanks for having me. Good, I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, obviously, sorry to hear about your injury. Hopefully your recovery goes well, um, and obviously we'll keep our fingers crossed for everything to, to go well, and hopefully we'll be back sooner than later. Um, yeah. Well, we always end with giving our, our guests one final bit of promo time, and I know you're injured at the minute, and hopefully you'll be back soon, but when you do return, when you are back in British wrestling, um, whether it's a, a North or TNT or, or down in London for maybe Coliseum or, or anything else, or, you know, maybe in, in America, if you get that WWE dream, hopefully we'll be rooting for that. But like wherever people see you on a show, once you're back, why is the Jack Stack Daddy of pro wrestling Shreddy going to be the person to check out? Because I'm Jack, I'm stacked, and that's a fact. There ain't no one in Brit rest, ain't no one in pro rest, ain't nobody on God's green earth like Shreddy.
So that's why you need to come and check me out. Because we all know no one is ready for Shreddy. Mm-hmm.